Liz Victor here, and I am an assistant professor in City and Metropolitan Planning at the University of Utah. And today I will be talking about Hurricane Maria and also Hurricane Irma in Puerto Rico and the role of planning in uh, recovery. Uh, so today we will talk about um, the impacts of Irma and Maria in Puerto Rico, the role of planning, especially looking at the four plans uh, shaping Puerto Rico, which is the Economic Development and Recovery Plan for Puerto Rico, the Fiscal Plan for Puerto Rico, the Hazards Mitigation Plan and Disaster Recovery uh, Action Plan. Uh, so Hurricane Hirma um, happened in September 6th of 2017, and it's a Category 5 hurricane of 185 miles per um, winds, uh, 14 inches uh, of rain, and some of the effects was like that one third of the whole island uh, was left without um, power. Um, and this was like, oh, well, you will see that actually like after that uh, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. So, but, so by the time the Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico already, there was like one third of people without electricity. Um, because like uh, electricity is like tied with um, uh, being able to get water. 56,000 people didn't have possible water. Um, and um, because of the electricity, you will have like a lot of the gas stations are um, not in service. Um, so 40% of them were not available. The same thing with like the banks and like ATMs, um, lots of like roads were blocked, telecommunications were down. And at the time that Maria hit, uh, there was already like 4,000 people that were in shelter um, because they have lost their homes so or they were like um, in danger um, and actually like four people lost their lives um, after working in Irma. So working Maria was just fit, hit Puerto Rico like two weeks later and it's a category four hurricane so it's like less strong than uh, Maria but if you can see the trajectory of like Hurricane Maria it went actually like through the middle of the um, island. And it was like the most devastating hurricane in 80 years. The death toll, the official direct deaths were like 64, but there were like about 3,000 indirect deaths. So these are people that um, needed like medical attention, for instance. Um, they were diabetic and they could not get their dialysis and they passed away or they uh, needed their breathing machines were not available or they had a heart attack, they couldn't get into the hospital in time or the local hospital didn't have electricity to be able to treat them. So there's many reasons of why this like death toll was like so high in terms of like the indirect deaths associated um, with the loss of power and with the situation um, after Hurricane Maria. And uh, this hurricane was like the 10th most intense um, on record. And it was like the third closest storm in the United States. So 90,000 or 90 billion uh, after Hurricane Katrina, which was like 160 billion and Harvey 125 billion. Um, and it was actually uh, a worldwide record in terms of like um, the second largest blackout after like super typhoon Yolanda in the Philippines in 2013 because like the whole island lost electricity and for most people it was months um, and for many it was like many many months. Um, so FEMA broke like very records in Puerto Rico. The side this credit report called the 2017 hurricane season and it also like it details how the hurricanes um, including like Hurricane Harvey. Um, and this uh, report says like um, some of the records that were broken, like it was the lengthiest air mission delivering food and potable water in the United States history, the largest delivery of commodities due to a natural disaster, the largest sea bridge operation of federal uh, disaster aid, the, last, the largest disaster generator installation mission in the United States, and one of the largest uh, disaster medical response missions and one of the largest disaster housing missions in the history um, of, of FEMA. The 
um, Hurricane really revealed that um, Boricua infrastructure was like very old um, and deteriorated. Um, there was a like, long term lack of investments in the island. Um, those like electric wires that you see, like 80% of the electric wire system was like on the floor or on the ground, um, resulting in 100% of lost power. Um, the power grid will need an investment of like 30 billion dollars to be restored. Um, and when something is like restored, it's restored to be the way it was. So like um, there will be like some funding for solar power, but like the priority is like actually to get everything um, just the way it was. And um, something I, that I think is important to mention because it's like a very different context is that um, in the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, which is called PREMA, PREPA, was responsible for 10% of like Puerto Rico, $74 billion debt. Um, and I don't know if you like um, knew that this was like the case, that Puerto Rico is in a massive uh, fiscal um, crisis and, and debt. And the majority of like the funds that were like borrowed from the government were for uh, PREPA. And it is argued that actually most of the funding went to like pay for pensions and not to actually like build um, or renovate the infrastructure. So this disaster also revealed that um, there's a lot of poverty in Puerto Rico. I think that people know that, of course, by looking at statistics, uh, Puerto Rico is about 50% of the people live below the poverty um, level. But um, what a lot of people describe is that they found poverty that they haven't seen before, of people that um, were older adults and they were adults uh, or were alone. And they didn't have like medicine or like people that care for them. There's a lot of people who were like homebound um, or disabled. Um, and like municipalities were really trying to document um, this because they wanted to know like in the, in the next disaster, okay, so who are the people who need help? And now we have had several next disasters um, talking about the earthquakes that started in like um, December of last year, but um, really um, end up being like uh, 6.1 um, earthquake in um, January like 7 of this year and subsequent earthquakes and other coronavirus. So it's like, very important to actually determine um, where are the people that need the aid. Um, the other thing is that like working age adults and children have been on migrating at a very fast pace. So that's why Puerto Rico has like so a disproportionate amount of like older adults. Um, in terms of housing in Puerto Rico, like uh, about 50% of the units were damaged. So it's 1.56 housing units in total. So about 800,000 were damaged in some form, but 100,000, which is like 6% of the homes were like highly damaged. Um, so the average uh, repair that was needed, it was like $6,000 um, and it will cost about like $4.9 um, billion. But of course, like, about like six percent of those homes like it costs a lot a lot uh, more um, and that doesn't count the uh, homes that actually like there was like there in flood zones or landslides um, that maybe if they didn't receive like any major damages they actually like um, could be relocated and there's like funding for for that um, in terms of agriculture, so 90% of the crops were destroyed. Uh, remember that like coffee trees, you know, they take um, four years to actually give fruit. Um, a plantain um, could take like several years. Um, so there's like two billions of in losses and uh, there was a lot of cattle that um, died, poultry and so on. Um, and actually I should like, I guess, Oops, go back to that picture because I wanted to show you it's like my um, brother's like farm, um, which, you know, 
was highly destroyed and, and of course like a, even a year after um the the disaster he wasn't operating um not even on a third of the capacity that he was um before and you know that has been followed by several disasters since since then um to go back to this idea of like uh, migration so um a lot of like Puerto Ricans already have been um, leaving Puerto Rico. Um, and, but this is like looking at um, after like Hurricane Maria, where people were going in terms of like the top, top states. Um, and the majority were going to Florida, as like the majority were already going um, mm -hmm. to Florida, Pennsylvania, Texas, and um, all these other um, states. So a lot of people actually were um, going with like uh, temporary like um, housing vouchers um, from FEMA and finding like homes in motels in these like um, places and later on like transferring to Section 8. So uh, once people, you know, they register just the kids in school and so on, um, many of them will stay. So this is kind of like showing a map of where people um, went and um, these uh, graphs actually like shows um, well, what was happening even before the Hurricane Sima San Maria, uh, which was where they both were in 2017. So you can see um, that um, a, large, a lot of people left, but there was like a trend that I was really like going on since 2006 when Puerto Rico uh, was experiencing an economic uh, crisis and the fiscal crisis with like the seventy-two billion dollars um, in debt. In debt. So here you can think of like you know at first maybe the, from two thousand six to two thousand seven there might be like forty thousand people leaving, and then forty thousand more, um, and then more and more. Um, so here it just like um, shows like. Um, the the population in in Puerto Rico I'm, I'm more like the the estimates based on like um, you know like conservative estimates or more like liberal uh, estimates for particularly looking at the ages and um, what this like estimated a lot of people that were like younger and family with kids were the ones who left um, Puerto Rico and uh, so at at the end there was like it was like different numbers that people show, but there might be like at at the end maybe a hundred and eighty thousand people stay in the United States when two hundred and fifty initially like moved um from that year of like twenty seventeen to twenty um eighteen. So now I'm gonna talk about the four plans um shaping um the future of Puerto Rico. Uh, which is like the fiscal plan, uh, or like we will start actually with economic development and recovery plan for Puerto Rico, then the fiscal plan, then the hazard mitigation plan, and final disaster recovery um, action plan. So the first one is the economic development and recovery plan for Puerto Rico, um, which was um, published in August 8th of 2018. So this is actually just like a few months after like the hurricane and the uh, office that put together this um, or approved the plan is the Central Office of Recovery and Construction in Puerto Rico, previously uh, the Central Office of Recovery, Construction and Resilience or the CORE 3. Um, and they created a plan so um, that funds could be approved for um, the recovery of Puerto Rico. This plan has like 17 initiatives. Um, that are part of making Puerto Rico more resilient to future disasters and creating long-term um, economic recovery. So here, like the emphasis is again economic um, development, and um, basically it's just like saying this plan that there's 139 billion dollars in funds that will come from federal government, but also from foundations, nonprofits, and the government of Puerto Rico. And uh, I'm a planner, so I was like, looking specifically about uh, where the planning, how much it was like for, there was for planning funds. So it's like um, $590 billion for um, planning, 
but um, something that this plan has like that is different to other plans is that it includes things like um, education and like funds for municipalities and uh, for health. Um, this plan, of course, like many other plans, it will have like short-term goals and long-term goals. So in terms of like the short-term goals, goals is restoring essential infrastructure system like energy, water, communications, and transportation, improving emergency preparedness through improvement of infrastructure and uh, capacity of government employees to protect citizens in future disasters. Um, Long-term goals, it was like building the infrastructure, stopping immigration and fostering economic development, revitalizing urban centers, so in Puerto Rico there's a lot of vacant um, urban centers and abandoned urban centers, optimizing the scale of public services and improving data collection and management. So that's the other thing that um, data is very hard to get because it's not centralized in Puerto Rico. Um, there will be like departments that have this, departments that have that, and it's all like public information. So that's kind of like one of the things that is a major um, issue in terms of um, planning. Um, there was a participatory process for this, but um, in many of these plans, what you will see is that there's like consultants that get hired, um, that are like outsiders to do this kind of work, and they will actually like have conversations with many stakeholders, um, meaning interviews, focus groups, and um, public events. Um, and then they have like public hearings, for example, in Fajardo, Catania, just different towns, towns to receive like citizen input. Um, and some of the criticisms was like the plan was published in English for public comments, which is um, something that um, later on it was like fixed because people could not really go to the public hearing and comment in something that they didn't understand. So they ended up translating it, but it was like after the fact of the public comments. Um, and another criticism is that there was a that meeting, um, a, a final meeting, um, and then they, they actually uh, approved the plan immediately and they didn't make any changes. So it's like there was public input, but there was not um, changes that were actually made in the plan after people gave some input in a plan that it was written in English and it should have been um, translated into Spanish. Um, then we have like the fiscal plan for Puerto Rico and it's a plan that is like put together for the governor's um, office. So again, another consultant doing this, but for the governor's office. It was published in October 23rd of 2018 and approved by the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico. Um, and this plan really divides the island into four, four different like regions. Um, so um, the idea here is like how to save money, right? So Puerto Rico is in a fiscal crisis, in some massive debt of like 72 billion. So it's like trying to centralize the services um, and regionalize them. So instead, right now we have like 78 municipalities and the security, education, housing and family services are done um, at, a, at a more local scale. So the idea is like to regionalize all these services, um, like trash collection, for instance. And um, part of it is like that they're trying to do is like defund um, these 78 municipalities. And um, there's, there's actually like some statistics that show that um, these municipalities, the majority of them will actually be bankrupt without like the funding from the central government. And the other thing is that the fiscal plan um, cuts most of the funding from the municipalities and also from the University of Puerto Rico. So the University of Puerto Rico um, is being defunded I believe it's like more like 60% of the funds that they receive. And this is from 2018 to 2022. So we are they're in the process of like doing this um, already. And as I said before, like, you know, many of the municipalities will end up being bankrupt. So it's like 71 of the 78 municipalities will be bankrupt. Um, but still kind of like what is interesting is that the central government is not taking all of the cuts, um, just the municipalities and the University of Puerto Rico. And, um, 
The other thing that is interesting is that this plant actually like uses the um, funds that will be received in Puerto Rico from the federal government or also foundations to show that there will be some um, to show, to show that they, they will be part of the GDP um, of Puerto Rico. Um, at the same time, this plan also shows that there will be no growth of, um, of economic um, or of, of a GDP. So it basically will stay um, the same. Um, so it, it shows a pretty bad picture, really, of the future of Puerto Rico uh, economically. Um, So next is the uh, hazards mitigation um, plan. And uh, each one of the 78 municipalities needs to update this um, hazards mitigation plan. So this is something that each municipality is supposed to have. So the idea is just to update them. Although the majority of municipalities actually didn't have a hazards um, mitigation um, plan. So for many of them, it will be the first time that they have a hazards mitigation plan. Um, this is important because like, this is like where the FEMA funds will go to projects that are listed in this like hazard mitigation plans or to issues that are like um, presented here as um, being important for each one of the municipalities. So the, uh, there was like a several actually like contractors that were hired to do this and um, until now there's like 12 plants that have been approved um, but the they were like doing them like in badges and the next plants have not been approved because there was not enough public part participation so actually um, they were like rejected um, from um, the federal government um, because they need to be be approved and there's some guidelines like there's this specific type of public participation that needs to happen but one thing is interesting about this is i should be like multi-hazard so it should be looking at um hurricanes and typhoons and uh, tsunamis and earthquakes and we know that um, there was a lot of emphasis to the mitigation plans after the earthquakes to make sure that actually like multi-hazards are um, taken into consideration. Um, so some of the shortcomings might be that there was not a lot of before thought about being multi-hazards. Um, so it's something that people have to, or planners have to like say over and over again, this should be multi-hazards. Um, and as I said before, many of the older plants were not really available. They don't take into consideration climate change. Um, there's like um, research that shows that if they take into consideration climate change or multi-hazards, they tend to be like better um, plants. The, one of the major criticisms has been, however, that there's not um, linkages made between the hazard mitigation plans and the um, action plan, which is like for the CDBG DR funds or the, the CDBG DR funds or the community development um, block grants. Um, and there are also like concerns, as I said before, that there was not a lot of like public participation in these different um, plans. Uh, or the hazard mitigation plans. And now we are like in the last um, plan that is affected by Puerto Rico and it's the most important plan, which is the action plan, um, which is the one that says like how the CDBG, DR, or Community Development uh, Disaster Funds are going to be spent in Puerto Rico. And for this, um, the federal government allocated like $18.5 billion. Um, and there has been like several drafts um, the at first there was very little participation so 15 days of participation then like advocates and people organized to have like a little bit more time for the public hearings and for like sending letters um again this is a very important plan so this is why people were organizing so um 
uh, vehemently. Um, and um, this plan actually like has been already like, it's like the third uh, version that is like produced. And um, there's a lot of revisions that are made just as like different uh, programs evolve, but it has like 27 uh, programs. Um, and uh, as I said, the, the organization that manages this is like um, the local housing organization or Vivienda, that's a local uh, uh, agency in charge of like this plan and like how the funds uh, will be allocated. Um, but it has like many programs, as I said, there's like 27 programs, but some of the examples of the programs are repair and reconstruction and relocation program, the title program, the mortgage program, uh, home assistance, um, and in the case, like one billion for housing, 145 billion for economic prioritization, 55 billion for community planning, and 100 million for um, infrastructure. Um, here, I'm going to discuss like a few of the most like interesting um, programs. So, the um, building reconstruction and re uh, relocation program, which is called also the three R's um, program. It has like $2.18 billion and the idea is like people will use this money to be relocated from the flood zones and also from the landslides. So if a person is in a place that is like prone to flood zones, they can actually like, um, if they need a repair in their home, um, they will actually like could use those, that, the, that fund to actually like, um, move somewhere else. So the the home their home will be like demolished and it will be a green field um, and then they can move somewhere else. If there's a person that doesn't have any damages to their home, um, so they can choose if they want to stay where they are, but they might be cognizant that um, if there's like a future um, natural disaster, the place might be um, flooded um, or the home my uh, slide or, or collapse um, and uh, people or families can get onto $150,000 which you know they can use to buy a home or like mortgage the rest they can actually um, use it to stay in Puerto Rico or stay in the communities or they can move to the United States so there's a lot of like flexibility of this program one of the flexibilities that doesn't have that is not like in um, in New Orleans, after like Hurricane Katrina, that the, the homes could be raised. So in most places in the United States, they can raise, raise homes, but the, the government of Puerto Rico decided that would not be an option in Puerto Rico. So a lot of people are contesting that, but um, there's a lot of technical reasons that they are putting forward saying that they cannot um, do that from construction calls to, to other things. Um, so the other program that is like very interesting is a title program. So it's like $40 million that would be dedicated to the title program. In Puerto Rico, there's a lot of informal um, construction and it's a different types of informal construction. So 45 to 55 of our homes um, do not have like any, um, are not built up to code, right? So it's just like simply people build them uh, on their own and they um, might not be, safe because of that. They could be, but the point being is that um, they're not conforming homes. And um, there's like other homes, however, like 20% of the homes, so we are talking about 260,000 homes that do not have title. And there's many reasons of why uh, people might not have titles. It could be that they um, took land that they wasn't theirs. It could be that they bought land from somebody who took land that it wasn't there. It could be that they are living in a family farm um, that has been subdivided, but nobody has titles. It could be that they live in a um, employer's um, land. Um, so there could be many reasons for not um, having title. But right now there's a very important conversation taking on about um, people being able to obtain um, titles. And um, it costs to being able to afford a lawyer about $3,500 um, in fees and plus the lawyer and so on. And obviously you have to apply. Um, and uh, so people are contesting also, you know, what are the benefits or what is the um, things that we don't like about having titles, right? So it's like, you know, you have to have an address, you have to pay taxes. Other reasons why people resist to also having um, 
titles. Um, there will be like some funding for the low income housing tax credit, so like $400 million. There was like a law passed to make Puerto Rico like 98% of Puerto Rico opportunity zone and try to attract inv investors. Um, and again, there's like a lot of funding that will be coming specifically for planning and also for like community resilience over um, several um, years. And there's like um, actually a um, nonprofit organization that was like chosen to manage the whole community resilient planning program, which is one of the 27 programs. Um, and this um, is just for planning. So it's like this money is given to actually communities and they can use up to like half million dollars to create a plan. Um, so a lot of people in the community have been talking about. Um, how to organize and what they can do um, in order to come up with these plans because these plans are actually like tied to some of the funding. 